Hello, my name is Andy Duncan. I'm a professor of English at Frostburg State University, and I'd like to begin by reading my department's new land acknowledgement statement. Quote, Frostburg State University occupies the land on which Native Americans have lived for over 10,000 years. Many Eastern Woodlands tribes inhabited this area including the Monongahela, Iroquois, and Susquehannock, who spoke Iroquois, and the Shawnee and Delaware, who spoke Algonquin. We acknowledge and honor Maryland's three state-recognized tribes, the Piscataway Indian Nation, the Piscataway Conaway Tribe, and the Akahannock Indian Tribe. In addition, Frostburg State University's Department of English and Foreign Languages acknowledges that part of our university's campus is on the side of the former Brownsville or Park Avenue neighborhood, a predominantly African-American community that began in 1866. Between 1927 and 1962, the state of Maryland forced many owners to sell their properties to accommodate the incremental growth of the university campus displacing residents, organizations, and businesses within Brownsville." End quote. I thank my department for that language, which I endorse. It is only right that we acknowledge all our predecessors. I hope the project I'm talking about fairly acknowledges them too, even if it does so in, well, a weird way. In fact, earlier this year, CNN.com called me an expert on weirdness. I decided I might as well own that. So my fall 2021 sabbatical project is dedicated to Western Maryland weirdness, a comprehensive collection of local legends, ghost stories, UFO sightings, cryptozoology, anomalies, weird science, roadside attractions, historical oddities, cults, fringe groups, parapolitics, scandals, disasters, unsolved murders, basically anything interesting that is unlikely to find official sanction in a Chamber of Commerce brochure. I thank the university and my colleagues for their support, and I dedicate this project to the late Dave Knotts, a Frostburg State alumnus who, as one of my undergraduate students, loved talking to me about this stuff. Thank you, Dave. For Focus Frostburg, I thought I'd do a very quick run through of some highlights from my collection that relate to sustainability. Let's face it. Our lo local track record of care for the environment, for the flora and the fauna and the land itself is not always good. The same is true, alas, for our track record of caring for one another, economically, politically, judicially, systematically. And how sustainable even are our stories themselves? Let's consider at the start place names. A friend pointed out long ago that housing developments tend to be named after whatever was destroyed to build the development. This is an old tendency in place names, and we see it in our area too. The original giant outcrop of Flintstone that named Flintstone was destroyed generations ago. Cave Town was named for a magnificent cave long quarried out of existence. Garrett County has Buffalo Marsh and Buffalo Run, but no more buffalo. Washington County has Elk Ridge, but no more elk. In 1941, Hamill Kinney identified 19 Maryland place names that included the word beaver. But where are the beavers today? Animals don't fare too well in a lot of the weirdness I've researched, actually. 
A living entombed frog, supposedly unearthed by miners in Lonaconing, made the front page of the New York Times more than a century ago, but the frog sadly took only a few breaths before dying, as if the air had killed it. A flock of wild goats populated Dan's Mountain after their owner went away to World War II, but they didn't last long. Hunters, finding semi-tame goats to be excellent sport, shot them all dead. Vale Summit was once regionally famous among enthusiasts of cockfighting. And one of the weirdest collections in the area is Frostburg State University's room full of taxidermied wild animals in Compton Hall, donated by the big game hunter who traveled halfway around the world to bag them. I go over sometimes to stare at them and they stare back at me. But back to place names. Native American names are everywhere around us. Allegheny County, for example, and the Potomac River. But Old Field and Old Town likewise refer to indigenous communities. Wills Creek and Wills Mountain, according to local tradition, are named for the last surviving indigenous resident of Cumberland. The mysterious stone circles in Green Ridge State Forest may or may not be the work of Native Americans, but the name Stickpile Hill on the CNO Canal may well commemorate a Native American tradition. I quote from Hamill Kenny's The Place Names of Maryland, quote, it was an Indian custom to build wayside memorial brush heaps to which each passerby added a twig or branch. Small wonder there's a ghost story about someone buried beneath the stick pile. The best known local legend involving Native Americans, however, is undoubtedly the legend of the Narrows, of the tragic interracial romance that led the lovers to jump off the cliff, a.k.a. Lover's Leap. This is perhaps the most common local legend in the eastern United States, told wherever there is a cliff or a waterfall and a long-destroyed indigenous community. It is simply easier to think about a noble indigenous individual choosing to die for love than to think about the genocide next door. I wrote about this years ago in my book, Alabama Curiosities, because the legends are told in Alabama too. At Niagara Falls, the Maid of the Mist tour boat is named for the local version of the tragic princess. The legend of the Narrows is not even unique in Allegheny County. A very similar story has been told about Dan's Rock. But I'm fascinated too by Gypsy Grove in Frostburg. In 1974, in the Journal of the Alleghenies, J. Marshall Porter wrote a fond, if romanticized, recollection of his childhood. Quote, while I was growing up, many caravans of gypsies used to stop at the little half-moon-shaped grove at the lower end of our farm. Long before my time, someone had named the place Gypsy Grove. This grove has been a haven for roving gypsies for a hundred years. Where was this, I wonder? And what could Romany scholars tell us about it? And does it have anything to do with Fiddlesburg in Washington County, which Hamill Kenny tells us was named long ago for, quote, a group of itinerant fiddlers, end quote. Romany fiddlers, I wonder? The most controversial place name is doubtless Negro Mountain in Garrett County. The signs along I-68 through the years startled many a driver and caused recurrent headlines, whereupon local white people always told various competing origin stories, all in agreement that 
there was a heroic black man of colonial times whom the name supposedly honored. The state highway signs finally came down. One of them is in a museum now. But the name remains, and so do all the issues inherent in the name. The same is true, to some extent, in Vale Summit, which adjoins Frostburg. For much of its history, it was known as Pompey Smash, and it still lies on Pompey Smash Road. Now, Pompey Smash, P-O-M-P-E-Y space S-M-A-S-H, is a fine, peculiar name. Superior, in my opinion, to the self-contradictory Vale Summit, or Valley Peak. But it, too, has a racially problematic and mythical origin story about a black man named Pompey who wrecked his wagon there long ago. I have my own story to explain the name Pompey Smash. I have no objective evidence for it, which makes it just as good as that other story. Let us imagine a slave or a former slave named Pompey. He's a black man who was given at birth a classical name, the name of a Roman general. Slave owners liked giving their slaves such highfalutin names. It was one of their little jokes. Let's imagine further that Pompey is a smart man. He's an entrepreneur, and he has a very marketable talent. He's a moonshiner. He makes his own liquor. And it's very good liquor. He supplements his income by selling liquor to white people. He provides for his family this way. Maybe in this way, he even buys the freedom of his wife, his kids, his siblings, his parents. Who knows? But word gets around, and soon the path up the mountain is well trodden by customers who've heard a lot about the high quality of Pompey's liquor, of Pompey's steel, of Pompey's magical way with the raw ingredient, Pompey's special recipe sour mash. Pompey's mash. So that the whole hillside over time becomes known as Pompey's mash. And over time, long after Pompey's business has gone away, People mishear the name, the apostrophe falls off, the S gets redistributed, and the result is Pompey space smash. Later generations forget the moonshine operation, assume a wagon accident, and so forth. But I suggest we substitute an origin story about a proud and successful black entrepreneur. Let's see if it carries, catches on. Local historian Lynn Bowman has extensively documented the centrality of slavery and the slave trade to the pre-Civil War economy of Western Maryland in agriculture, in industry, in transportation, especially the stagecoach routes. The local history of slavery resonates in a number of legends. Mount St. Mary's University in Emmitsburg, for example, supposedly once had a dishonest worker named Leander who was caught stealing and therefore had his left hand cut off. Buried in the quadrangle, the disembodied hand has terrorized students ever since, scratching on the windows of McCaffrey Hall. In Mount Savage, meanwhile, which is named, I should note, not for a racial slur, but for a family named Savage, we find another horror story, the curse of old Coombs Farm, which holds that a child was killed on a plantation by the owner's dogs, whereupon the grieving mother cursed the place so that every successive owner died an untimely death. One wonders whether these horror stories can be traced back to real-life atrocities of slavery days. Another rich vein of local lore stems from our centuries-long local tradition of coal mining. 
A great source is the Miners Recollections Project, two volumes with a third on the way being sold at Armstrong Insurance in Frostburg to raise money for a coal miner memorial. The project documents hundreds of coal miner deaths in places with sadly resonant names, the Hungry Hill Mines, the Broken Heart Mine. These miners died in cave-ins. They died in mining car accidents. They suffered Seemingly minor injuries, then died of tetanus or gangrene. Several were killed by mules, several by horses. One died changing a light bulb and was electrocuted. In 1914, after digging for days, would-be rescuers reported, quote, the body of Thomas Bush was found in a standing position with his pick still in his hand, end quote. Many more died above ground of what we might call black lung, what they would have called miner's asthma. Lona Coning has an asthma bench where the retirees used to sit. Hence, coal mine ghost stories. The Frostburg Mining Journal's 1892 story about whistling Big Bill, the strongest miner in Western Maryland, who died saving his companions and whose whistling still can be heard in the mines, may be a fabrication. But more intriguing are two stories in the miners' recollections volumes. The first dates from 1893. Ernest Shell, a young miner aged 16, swore that his life had been saved at the old Pompey mine by the ghost of his dead brother John, killed at that very spot only nine days before. The second story dates from 1935. Mabel Mills recalled that her miner husband, Joe, was getting ready for work one morning when, quote, suddenly a rocking chair began rocking by itself with some force. Joe explained that it was a warning that someone in one of their families would soon die, end quote. But Joe Mills went to work anyway and was killed in a cave-in that very day. Now you may ask, how is that one a ghost story, to which I reply, who was rocking the chair. But the coal mines have left us a much more tangible physical legacy too. An underground mine fire had been burning for more than a century when I-68 was constructed through Frostburg. During the early years of the highway, smoke continued to belch from the cut in the mountainside. Burning Mines Road still exists by that name and dead ends past the landfill. In 1978, Frostburg State University, it was Frostburg State College then, asked the Maryland legislature for an emergency appropriation of $2 million. So many abandoned coal tunnels underlay the campus that the buildings were in danger of collapsing into the pits. The college got the money which was used to fill the shafts with concrete. The Hoffman drainage tunnel is a local engineering marvel. It was hand driven through solid rock for two miles at a uniform height and weight of eight feet. Construction took three years. It was designed to drain a flooded tunnel to free it up for coal mining, and it certainly accomplished that. In the first 24 hours of operation, 9 million gallons flowed out of the tunnel and into Braddock Run. Unfortunately, though the mining operations ceased long ago, the Hoffman drainage tunnel is still draining. If you park at Clarysville, you still can see the toxic orange water polluted with sulfuric acid and sulfate of iron 
as it empties into Braddock Run and hence the Chesapeake Bay watershed. The Orange Stream flows along old US 40 all the way to Lavelle. It's been an industrial polluter for 115 years and counting. The weird legacy of local industry is all around us. Every December, the baby Jesus is laid in the mouth of the historic Lonaconing Iron Furnace, site of the town nativity scene. The old Artmore Plastics Building overlooks downtown Cumberland, a visible ruin on the mountainside. Beautiful photographs of the eerie interior of the Lonaconing Silk Mill, untouched since the day it closed generations ago are highlights of two recent books titled Abandoned Maryland. And here as everywhere, Civil War bloodshed has inspired a lot of ghost stories. Famous examples include Bloody Lane at Antietam and Spook Hill in Gathland State Park, where the dead soldiers try to push your car up the slope, mistaking it for a cannon. And Old Man Wise's haunted well of uncertain location, down which corpses were supposedly dumped after the battle. Other oft-told Civil War legends are what we might call civility stories. They emphasize polite and respectful behavior between the white combatants. For example, the often debunked legend of Barbara Fritchie and Frederick cemented by John Greenleaf Whittier's poem, in which a defiant old Unionist earns the respect of the Confederate general marching through town. Another example is the kidnapping of the Union generals from the garrison town of Cumberland by McNeil's Confederate Rangers. Many retellings make it sound like a merry exploit for all concerned, kidnappers and victims alike. These stories doubtless helped heal the nation, the wounds of the nation after the smoke cleared, but they also tend to elide the black experience and the black cause and therefore help pave the way for Jim Crow. One odd local Civil War event that I wish were better known is the death in Cumberland of young Union officer Fitz James O'Brien an Irish-American from New York City, from wounds suffered in a skirmish. O'Brien was an influential science fiction and fantasy writer, seen at the time as a worthy successor to Poe, but he is also regarded today as a queer icon, one of the pioneers of gay culture in Greenwich Village. There should at least be a marker. A lot of local weirdness reminds us that life has always been fleeting, even in peacetime and above ground. Garrett County has a dead man cave and a stretch of road still known as the Shades of Death. The infamous 17 mile grade, still the steepest stretch of railroad in the East, was claiming lives as recently as 2000 when 76 cars of a coal train derailed at 59 miles per hour, crushing a house near Bloomington and killing a 15-year-old boy. Gravity is not kind to heavy trucks either. The runaway truck in downtown Frostburg that ditched just past the Wise grocery store in March 2021 was a chilling reminder of two past disasters. Another runaway truck on Main Street in February 1981 killed three people, injured 11, and destroyed the restaurant on the corner where the 7-Eleven now sits. An earlier runaway truck in October 1955 careened all the way through Frostburg and made it to LaVale, where it hit two other vehicles at a stoplight and killed five people. The creepiest roadside memorial I have ever visited was at the infamous T-Junction in Bloomington at the foot of Backbone Mountain, where many runaway trucks descending Route 135 have fatally wrecked. There were 24 white crosses painted on the rock face, one for each victim. 
The most famous local transportation disaster, however, was the crash of a B-52 bomber on Savage Mountain during a bitter snowstorm in January 1964. Debris was scattered across multiple counties, and three of the five crewmen were killed. But the plane's nuclear bombs did not detonate. In the 21st century, the Clarysville Bridge on I-68, just east of Frostburg, has developed its own sinister reputation as a suicide bridge, to the extent that State Delegate Mike McKay is trying to get a high fence erected to prevent jumpers. Let me add that if you need help, please call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline right now. 800-273-8255. We need you. Two happier subjects, though they're still, I guess, death haunted. Some of my favorite local legends seem to carry the message that all wealth is fleeting. Indeed, somehow supernatural. According to legend, the Klein family of Frostburg became prosperous overnight when a ghost showed Mrs. Klein where money had been hidden inside the chimney bricks. A will-o'-the-wisp or spook light was once claimed to haunt Wright's Crossing in Frostburg between B&B &B Meats and the bowling alley. It supposedly appeared once a year on the anniversary of Mr. Graham's death and marked where the old man had buried his fortune. A similar tale was told of a will-o'-the-wisp at Bloomington, which supposedly marked where the lost gold of the Braddock expedition had been buried. <laughs> the legend of General Braddock's lost payroll, supposedly buried during his defeated, decimated, and dejected army's long retreat from Pittsburgh in 1730, oops, 1755, caused a lot of fruitless digging through the centuries. Braddock himself is buried just over the Pennsylvania state line, beneath a monument at Fort Necessity National Battlefield, which is supposedly haunted. The infamous Braddock Stone, now a fine outdoor exhibit in front of the Frostburg Museum on Main Street, probably had nothing to do with General Braddock, and is so historically dubious that for many years, Frostburg State kept it hidden out of sheer embarrassment. But I cherish it as a big, heavy public memento of our area's favorite origin story of noble failure. My two favorite roadside attractions in Frostburg, however, share the same property on I-68 and both had their genesis in religious visions. Noah's Ark being rebuilt here. That used to be the old billboard beside the massive steel skeleton next to God's Ark of Safety Church. The never finished project, not yet finished, originated in a series of visions experienced by Pastor J. Richard Green in 1974 as he describes in his book aptly titled, God Said Rebuild the Ark. And the three crosses in front of the ark were the first in Maryland, I believe, to be erected by the West Virginia visionary Bernard Coffendafer, who spent his fortune erecting trios of gold and blue crosses nationwide. His story is told in Jacob Young's documentary, Point Man for God, and a complete list of locations can be found at crossesacrossamerica.org, a nonprofit attempt to document, maintain, and restore these remarkable folk art installations. Skipping ahead here because I'm running out of time. I do worry sometimes that weirdness itself, or at least these unique local flavors of it, is itself unsustainable. Has anyone, for example, seen the Garrett County ghost of Fallen Timbers Road in decades? It used to walk along the road in broad daylight and vanish when people tried to speak to it. 
But what about the various haunts of South Mountain? The Dwayo, the Snarly Yow, the Woman in White, or the Veiled Lady of Williamsport? Does anyone locally still tell their kids when the Christmas tree is taken away that the Bell Snickles came and got it? Santa's uh, affably monstrous cleaning crew, the, the wild things of the North Pole. The movie theater in Frostenburg Plaza was supposedly haunted. A friend who's a paranormal investigator believes he saw a ghost there one night. But the theater has been closed for years, so to quote Shirley Jackson, whatever walks there walks alone. What happens when the theater is demolished one day? Will that ghost story simply disappear? Go the way of our Western Maryland ghost towns like Monocacy and Vindex? Or maybe go the way of the Porter Chemical Company of Hagerstown, which sold countless chemcraft chemistry sets nationwide in the 1950s and 1960s until parents decided that toxic chemicals were something to keep their kids away from. How long, I wonder, will people continue to answer the annual call in Gruber's Hagerstown Almanac? Let Aunt Lydia predict the sex of your next child. According to the Almanac, Lydia Klein, a retired nurse who died in 1973, quote, developed a method for predicting the sex of expected offspring of anyone with an uncanny level of accuracy and has inspired an annual feature of the Almanac since 1962. How much longer will that last? And how about this 2017 obituary in the Cumberland Times News? for the late Mr. Everett Lee Llewellyn of Lona County, age 95. Quote, he had an impressive green thumb and he could witch water, end quote. That's W-I-T-C-H. He was a dowser. He was a water witch. How many water witches are left, I wonder, to carry on the tradition? Some things, however, give me hope. I read in the Big Book of Maryland Ghost Stories, published in 2010, a classic account of a crisis apparition, a phantom that foretells disaster, involving a snowmobile accident on Deep Creek Lake. In the past, these stories would have involved horses and buggies. Today, they involve ski dudes. I encourage this trend. That flock of wild goats supposedly wiped out by the lazy hunters at mid-century. One of my colleagues says they've seen goats in those woods as recently as the past couple of years. Maybe the hunters did not get them all. One of my students told me not long ago that during an overnight camping trip in the middle of Green Ridge State Forest, they heard a phantom piano being played many miles from any piano. And just this month, one of my students shared with me the story of the curse of Old Coombs Farm, as they are one of the descendants of that supposedly ill-fated line and they are dedicated to keeping the story alive into the 21st century. I'm out of time, but I have so much more weirdness to talk about. If you have some weirdness of your own to relate, or if you would just like to be updated on my project as it is written and published, please email me, arduncan, A-R-D-U-N-C-A-N, or write me, C.O. Frostburg State's English Department. 101 Braddock Road, Frostburg, Maryland, 21532. Thank you all.